So getting back to succession though. So it's just like, okay, like I'm back. So I'm just like, yeah, I'm back. It's like, what do we do? Like we can't be in power forever. What are we gonna do about succession? So his strategy was as follows. Didn't want his own importance to be that height. Didn't want to be like an equivalent of a mouse. So tried to stay away. Two successors he chose early, Ho Yabang, Zhao Ziyang. Um, he gave them the positions rather than him having the position himself. The only top one he kept for himself is the Central Military Commission. Either that was lobbied for by the military or one who thought he was too popular to give up himself, but he kept that. And he also wanted his own generation to retire too. So he set up the Central Advisory Commission, which would basically just consist of the old people. And what the power it had was he did this to get the old people out of the standing committee of the Politburo, like the actual positions. He's just like, man, you guys move over to this committee. You'll still have like viewing access. You can still go into the meetings, but you just can't cast a vote. So it was essentially moving them out just so like Dung and other people can get their successors in, but they were still pretty much in power and also just stress the importance of institutions, regularized procedures, start meeting regularly again. Yeah. But meanwhile, like, Deng and Chen could never really agree. Like, the economy would always expand for a bit and then retrench. And this was really concerning to foreign investors. They didn't really know, like, what's China doing, man? Like, Hu Yaobang was definitely not against that. And um, in 1986, um, this was the first kind of, well, I don't know if it was the first, but it was one time when, like, especially the students were getting upset. And, like, this is all from that one video that I showed at the beginning, like this moving on for a while. It's all from that one really good video. And like 30,000 like marched in Shanghai and they were just like, you know, they want to like have the local candidate just like do a better job, like quit sucking so much, you know, like they're just trying to get their frustrations out somewhere. And Jiang Zemen was actually the head of Shanghai at that time and he kind of calmed things down. But the students in Beijing, they weren't satisfied. So January 1st, that while everyone, while everyone else in the country went back to school, the Beijing students did not return. They actually marched to Tiananmen. And then, you know, like, the police service was there, ready for them, and kind of, like, hassling them up, getting out. And then Hu Yobang actually, like, steps in, you know, got them all bust, was trying to get them not arrested. Just like, get out, guys, get out. Like, what are you doing here? This angered the conservatives, and that actually forced them out. <clears throat> so he was the president at the time. And the conservatives were essentially like, yo, we're quite angry with you, like, we didn't like that. It wasn't just that, though. Another thing, the year before, he actually wanted all the conservatives, every, all the, the leaders to retire. So in 1986, or 1985, he was 71 years old, Hu Yabang, 71 years old. He was considered one of the younger of the older generation. He was still a revolutionary. And Deng Xiaoping was still the... the the chairman of the Central Military Commission still wouldn't give it over to Hu Yabong, even though Hu Yabong was 71. Just, you're being too antsy, being too antsy at 71. So that angered them before, and then this incident was just like, all right, we're getting rid of Hu Yabong. So that was the first successor of Deng Xiaoping is now gone. Also, students were being assigned jobs in remote areas too, which they weren't too happy. And then he dies April 15, 1989. And like, just watching the video and just having the students talk about it, they were just like, ah, oh, you know, like, who died? Like, he was, he was, like, their guy, you know? They just had no idea how to express themselves. At the time, there's no Weibo or anything. Like, there's no blogging. Like, there's literally no way to express yourself at that time. So what they did, he dies, students go back to Tiananmen. They're just kind of standing there, and while they were there, they took the opportunity to make demands. They asked for freedom of speech, you know, right to form student unions, which do exist now and like end of government corruption <coughs> and um, <coughs> like they actually, this, the actual funeral itself was April 22nd and there's actually this clip of like the three of them going up and kind of kneeling in front. They're act the police actually allowed them to go by and they had their demands and they weren't accepted. So it was kind of just like, they didn't want to just leave, right? It's just like, well, if we just leave then we kind of lose and like, they didn't, like, even acknowledge us at all. Like, what the hell? So more people came just to kind of check things out. And then April 26th, Doug wrote an editorial <coughs> in the People's Daily, which is basically the most people of the party, called it political turmoil. And turmoil is when there's nothing good, right? If you call it political turmoil, it's just like, nothing's good, it's bad. 
guy should leave. And this straight up offended a lot of the students. They were like, well, we call this political turmoil? Like, we're, we're here for the whole country. Like, there should be some changes, right? It's just like, they're just like, what the hell, man? And the next day, like, students just flocked. Like, there's video footage of just, like, police officers trying to stand in the way, but they were literally just pushed through, and people were pushing through, and, like, people in the crowds, like, were cheering them. But on May 13th, like, after a couple, like, weeks of them just kind of being there, May 13th, like, the more radical ones came in, and they actually started the hunger strike. And this was the day before Gorbachev was supposed to make his visit, you know, reconciling the Soviet Union and China. It's supposed to be a big moment. And they go and start in a hunger strike. Meanwhile, like all the press is there, the global press is there for Gorbachev's visit. And more students start much of the country. They're enthusiastic to get there, but they're very unorganized. They didn't really know what they were doing. It was so spontaneous. Tiananmen came and rolled its own. People were making shirts. You know, there's like music going, there's bands going. It was just like, what's going on here? And eventually more workers, teachers, even people in daily reporters joined. And after three weeks, many of the students wanted to go back. They're just like, all right, whatever. We'll just like lobby with them back like back then on campus, but like the radical ones, they still wanted to stay. <clears throat> you know, workers eventually started their own unions, and then May 18th, five days after the hunger strike, they actually had a televised meeting. Like this meeting was on television, and it was Lee Pong, the premier at the time, and like a bunch of other student leaders, and they were talking, and it was just, it was basically just a mess, like, Apparently, like one student, like the students were just so nervous. One student would say this, it's like, no, we need this demand, you know, we need this demand. Like, there was really no negotiating with them at that time. And later that day, like, Zhao Ziyang comes out, just like, please, guys, just leave, like, we get it, you know, like, I'm sorry, like, he was in tears. And actually, Wen Jiao Bao was there too, which is quite interesting. And then the next day, he sacked, so that's second of, ja of uh, Deng's successors. He sacked, Marshal de Gaulle is declared, hunger strike ends, and the army's brought in, but they're just like brought by the people. Like the army's just on like trucks, right? They're just like being brought in, but there's just people there blocking the way. And that, that lasts for two weeks. Meanwhile, Jiang Zemin's brought in from Shanghai. He's just straight up like put in like regular person's clothes. <clears throat> you know, he's, they brought him up apparently because of the way he dealt with 1986. They're like, oh, this guy's got experience, you know, he's from Shanghai, whatever. They brought him up, and then, yeah, they received orders, apparently, from this frontline video, take the square by 6 a.m., spill no blood, and then, yeah, so that's just a picture of me, standing outside, that was a great hall of people. It's not totally in focus, but it's pretty cool. So his succession plan was basically a flop for the following reasons. He lobbied others to give up power while retaining it himself. He was just like, yeah, you know, guys move on to this committee, which he did move on to, but he still very much wanted to be in control. Like he didn't give up the, like, the CMC chair, even though in the Constitution of 82 it said it must be a standing committee member of the Politburo. Well, he was still keeping it. So it became very apparent that by 1989, like it was kind of assumed a bit before, but it was a very apparent that country was still ruled by people from like the 40s, like from like the Japanese war. Like the country in 1989 was still being ruled by these people. They were like in their 80s. It was just a different time. And like Jiang Zemin, moving back to secession, he was only allowed to bring one person with him, which is Zheng Qinghong. Yeah, he was really helpful with him in the 90s. And like Jiang, like Jiang comes in, you know, Deng Xiaoping's kind of cast aside of it. Zhang doesn't really know what to do. He's kind of just, because this is Beijing, right? He has no one there. Like, with all the power involved with knowing people, he knows no one there. He's kind of just like, yeah, hey guys, what's going on? Then finally, Deng Xiaoping did his southern tour in 1992. <clears throat> basically put a line for Zhang. It's like, either you're with me or against me. And he decides to go with them and supports them. And in 1992, Hu Jintao is also designated the successor. <clears throat> Reasons why? Um, he was just, Hu Jintao was just considered a very smart individual, but pho like photographic memory. Um, he was just so keen. He was also very, worked very well with both conservatives and the reformers. And apparently he was actually recommended by one of the conservatives to be the leader. So I was just like, okay. So 1992 they decided Hu Jintao will be the leader like in 2002. That was 10 years before they picked Hu Jintao to be the president. And then, 
you know how uh, Zhou and Lai died before Mao Zedong? It was kind of like the same thing here, who was going to die first. And even though, and like Chun Yun actually dies first, which was fortunate for like Hu Jintao, and, and just, just was fortunate for just keeping the reform open. Um, Deng was incaps in incapacitated in 94, so it was a really interesting position for Jiang Zemin because it's under authoritarian rule by the top few guys, but Deng's still alive. So he still has this protection, although he's incapacitated, so Jiang can start doing kind of more what he wants. He can start bringing in his people in. Then Chun Yu dies, and then he charges the Beijing secretary. They had him on embezzlement, which is apparently a really small case of embezzlement, but they got him removed anyway. And I don't know if it was that guy or the dude after that was installed that was one of Jiang Zemin's guys, but that happened soon. Deng finally dies in 1997, and then they made the retirement more of a 70 to remove like another guy that was one of Jiang's rivals. And <clears throat> okay, from here on out, I'm just gonna just do things off the top of my head because making PowerPoint presentations are really pain in the ass. <laughs> 